Kelly. I work for the Kay County OSU Extension Office. Uh, I've been there since June of 2018. Uh, before that, I was a grain merchandiser. I bought grain. I worked with farmers every single day. Uh, so agriculture is kind of in my blood, and beekeeping is definitely agriculture. I've got a little bit of experience with pesticides myself. Most of what I've learned has been training from Oklahoma State University. We do a whole lot of required training. There's a whole lot of pesticides out there that are called restricted use or something along those lines where you either need to be a professional or licensed at some level. I don't believe we'll be talking about any of the unlicensed ones today. How many of you guys have used a pesticide of some sort in your life? Anybody who didn't raise your hand, I'm probably telling you you're wrong, okay? Because there's a whole lot of, we'll, we'll go over kind of what a pesticide is. That wasn't a catch-22, I'm usually a pretty nice person. So let's see if we can move to the next slide. There we go. It works. That's great news. All right, so what is a pesticide? We then ask the question, what does it control? So most people, when they think of a pesticide, they think kill, that it kills something, that it puts something out of my way, gets it taken care of. There are certain pesticides that only repel. Does anybody know a brand name pesticide that just repels? Oh. Off. Yeah, so that would be kind of an insecticide of some sorts, but it's not killing, okay? So how many of you guys have used bug spray before? A lot more hands coming up. Here's another one, bactericides. Can anybody think of a bactericide that is commonly used in almost every household? Lysol. Lysol, or any kind of bleach cleaning product, anything that kills that. So when we're going through safety meetings with some companies and talking about how they need to have the proper labeling on everything, if they've got a bottle of Windex, that's a chemical of some sort. They have to have that labeling on there. If they've got a bottle of mixed water and bleach, that has to be labeled properly. So those are pesticides of some sort. Now, usually when we hear the word pesticide, most people could think of killing some kind of insect or rodent. But anyway, all of these on this list, and there's plenty more out there, are a pesticide that covers the broad range of trying to control something. Um, the most common ones, though, are insecticides, larvicides, herbicides, and rodenticides. Some of us have heard of some of the other ones out there. All right. So what's a pest? Anybody have some pest problems in their life right now? I heard someone asking about mites on bees. What's your pest problem? No, I don't have Oh, you just have them? I hope I don't have them. <laughs> you, you hope you don't have them. They, they, nature tends to take its course. You know, my, bugs got to have food, too. What was that? Dragonflies have to eat. Dragonflies, yep, yep. There's all kinds of pests that we run into in life, and sometimes they're just there and not causing too much of a problem. For example, maybe someone has a snake in their home. We really don't want it there, but... If we like them to get rid of rodents, we maybe want it outside. <laughs> you know, it's just not in the right place. So a pest is something in a location you don't want it to be. Dandelion, easy pest. That's a pest in my yard. I don't want it in my lush green yard. What? Bees work dandelion thoroughly in the year, get a lot of pollen on them. Exactly. Exactly. So for you, it's not a pest. It's not for you either, you're saying it. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> we're we're going to get into it, yeah, uh, on, on all of it. Quit wearing that thing, you're not getting enough oxygen. <laughs> Can you not hear me breathing? <laughs> I'll keep the band on there, but yeah. I'll tell you, that is an ideal there, but we're far enough away from you guys. But anyway, a dandelion to some people. It's not. It's in my yard, I don't want it there. Another one, does anybody know what this bug is? Anybody have horses? Nobody has horses in here. It's a blister beetle. Has anybody ever heard of blister beetles in alfalfa? I thought they were black with the orange on the butt. There are multiple different color variations of them. Okay, we have a whole bunch of the black ones with the orange, yes. but I've seen those, but not as many as the black ones. Yes, uh, I, I get pictures, a couple pictures every year. Is this a blister beetle? Do I need to worry about it in my alfalfa? If you have horses, yes you do. They, if they get in just a couple of them, it'll drop them dead. It's a, it's a dangerous thing. One of the ways people avoid that is that first cutting of alfalfa is usually very low risk of that. But it's a pest. There are some pesticides out there that you can spray to limit the risk of having blister beetles. 
uh, out there. So, next one. A lot of people don't like this one. Just a tick. Yep, just <laughs> I get them all the time walking through my woods and this stuff. I, I can't stand them. You spray that deep on there, try to get them to get away from you, but sometimes they just don't get away from you. And uh, probably the most notorious or maybe po most pop culture pest ever, pesky neighbors. Which I don't know, I don't know if you count the water hose squirting on or something to get them away, making you making that as the pesticide to get them away. But pest comes in, the point is pest comes in all shapes and sizes. All right. So the question, you've got a pest, you've got something that you don't want to be there. Now you've got to ask yourself the question, do I need to spray? And this is probably the most important part of the thing because I work at the extension office, I get pictures of bugs, I get pictures of weeds, I get pictures of funny looking things on trees, and usually the first question I get is, how do I kill it? What do I spray on? My favorite one recently, and I won't name names, it wasn't anybody in this room. Somebody called me, he had been sitting on his back porch under his oak tree, and a caterpillar fell and landed on his table, almost in his coffee cup. And he held it, he took a picture of it, and sent it to me, he said, what is this and how do I kill it? I looked, I looked at the picture, I kind of dug through a couple of things. Uh, it was a particular type, type of oak leaf, caterpillar that turns into an oak leaf beetle that will eat on oak leaves. I said, well, you got, a, you got an infestation of them? You got a bunch of them up there? Well, this is the only one I've seen. What do I spray to kill it? Well, I think you've taken care of the problem. It's right there. So a lot of times, we just need to analyze the situation and determine if we do need to spray. So I'll go with the first one here. Uh, we're going along with this. Mechanical control can work. How many of you guys plow? To plant. I know Dan does. I was out there looking at clover with him. You guys, you guys plow, work the ground to plant. Exactly. That's a form of weed control. It's not pesticide, of course, but it's a form of weed control. Hand pulling weeds. I know a lot of people are against that. You know, getting down and pulling on stuff like that. <laughs> I'd rather use something a little bit easier, but it works. Squashing the eggs of the bugs. Does anybody have squash plants in their garden? Easiest way to get rid of squash bugs is flip that leaf over, squash all those eggs as you're going by. Limits a problem before it becomes a problem out there. Mowing. If you mow, a lot of those taller weeds don't have a chance to succeed. And then also trapping. Pheromone traps is a big one. Uh, in the pecan industry, they use a lot of pheromone traps uh, in order to capture some of those pesky bugs that they have. A lot of times I see stuff like this, though. <laughs> where uh, you've got a little bit bigger tool for, than the job you have at hand. So you, you tend to overdo it a little bit. And if you guys have any more uh, questions about this, this is a little tiny. It'll be on your uh, slideshow, though. We have fact sheets out there, and that particular one is all different types of mechanical pest control that's out there. A lot of it's preventative, but a lot of it does a pretty good job as well. This, is, this year is one of my personal favorite forms of uh, pest control, burning. Pretty cheap too. A little bit, a little bit of a liability because you, you have a right to burn, but it could be a liability. But man, that'll take care of a whole lot of problem weeds in certain areas for you. And if you do it during the time of year in February and March when it's less than 50 degrees outside, a lot of your pollinators are not out at that time of year, so you don't even have to worry about scorching a couple of them at that time of year. So if you burn. Do what? The lungs are at work. Yes, <laughs> yes. There it goes. All right, so we're going to analyze the situation a little bit. Does anybody know what type of weed this is in a soybean field here? It grows real, it can grow up to about six feet tall, kind of like a switch. Got to be in your pasture. Got to be in your pasture, <laughs> yep, yep. It's mayor's tail, okay? Now, one thing about mayor's tail is it, uh, it is a little, it's kind of tough to pinpoint it. Uh, it's not a traditional broadleaf like soybeans, so what would you maybe do, that this is a large field, and it goes all the way back to that tree line, what would you maybe do to take care of this problem? Get the big old tractor and hire the co-op out there with the big boom sprayers? Not quite, no. Maybe just a nice little four-gallon backpack spray. You're limited in the amount that you're going to spread out there. You're going to, you don't even have to mix the whole four gallons <laughs> just to take care of that spot. Or even better, big knife, come out there, chop it down. 
I know that we had uh, problems, we still do in soybean fields, with pigweed, resistant pigweed. Didn't really have a spray that we could go out there easily. I would see crews of six or seven people in Illinois going out there with big knives and just cutting big old tall pigweed plants down, throwing them in sacks and loading them in a trailer and then burning them back at the house. Sometimes that's the best method of getting rid of this stuff. We certainly don't want it to turn into a problem later where it puts down more seeds, gets more seeds in the seed bed. All right, here's another one. Anybody know what this little guy is? Tomato hornworm. Yep, one of the most common ones. How do I, how do I get rid of these? I want my tomatoes. I want to pay $25 to grow a plant that's going to grow me three tomatoes, <laughs> which homegrown tomatoes are delicious. They're some of my favorite things. But they tend to decimate it. This one little guy can eat almost a whole plant. So maybe, you know, if we've only got one, maybe we just pick him off instead. Or maybe we just use like a little one gallon sprayer. Has anybody ever, ever heard of the pesticide BT? Yeah. Uh, what does it do? It eats your guts out. <laughs> it, 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 if, you, if you aren't using the proper safety procedures, it can hurt yourself a little bit. We'll but, oh, yes. Uh, it's a bacteria. It's a bacteria that produces a protein that kills caterpillars. It doesn't kill inchworms. It doesn't kill beetle larva. It doesn't kill any of these other ones. So if you're having an infestation, that's the key word. If you're having an infestation of caterpillars, BT will do that. And for something like a small tomato crop, you don't need much more than about a gallon of it or something like that to cover all that. Or we do a little bit of preventive, preventative maintenance. Anybody, these are just some of the most voracious predators in the small animal world. They'll eat your aphids. If you've got corn or uh, soybean, or uh, I'm sorry, corn or sorghum or something like that, they'll eat, they'll eat up those sugarcane aphids. They'll also eat the larva and the eggs of some of your bite caterpillars, some of the ones that will eat up this stuff out there. And I checked on Amazon before I got here, not, this is not an endorsement for them, but you can have them delivered to your door for about $15 for about a thousand of them. So if you have an aphid infestation, these guys will take care of it pretty quick and it's a completely natural and organic way to take care of that. All right, does anybody, so we've got corn here, we talked about it just a second ago, do we know what's in the margins here? <laughs> Lots of weeds. This is pigweed. Uh, pigweed is that poster child that has become or that has started to see some fields develop resistance to some of our quote unquote more powerful herbicides here that fields are resistant to. One of the major reasons is people apply it every single year. And if you've got one in 10,000 plants that's resistant and it's able to come up again the next year and put off, in this case, with this type of weed, thousands and thousands of seeds, put down more of them, 50% of those seeds are resistant, and they keep doing the cycle over and over again, that's how you get resistant weeds. But this one here, we would almost certainly, if the whole field was like this, we would call that an infestation. That's a problem. That's something that's economically going to be a problem. If the whole field was like that, you wouldn't produce a crop. And I know there's some farmers out there that do need to make money. So in that case, we would actually get the big a sprayer out. We're going to get into when, where, how to not hurt the pollinators or to limit the exposure to those pollinators. So, so you do need to spray. <laughs> we get to that. We do need to spray. We realize that we have an infestation or there's an economic threshold that has been reached and we need to do it. We need to do something about this before it gets out of hand or before we lose our crop, something like that. The mantra of an extension is here. If anybody ever asks me about spraying something or killing something, the number one thing I'm going to tell or the number one thing I'm going to put on the bottom of an article, read the label. Because everything is different. They have different uh, evaporation rates for temperatures. You get some of them you can only spray under 80 degrees. Uh, some of them you can only spray during the time periods of when nothing is blooming. Probably because they're harmful to, to um, pollinators out there. Is there a, a yes. spray that is better, like it, since we're beekeepers, uh -huh. is there a spray, a general spray, to use that's better than what you would find on the shelf, like neem oil or something to that effect? So neem oil is one of the ones that we would suggest to put on there. 
The problem with neem oil, if it gets ingested by the bee, not, not if it gets on contact or uh, on the skin, if it gets ingested by the bee or almost any insect, it's probably going to kill the bee on there. So is it less toxic or less problematic? Yes. Is it going to completely not kill any bees? No. So that, that's kind of where we're trying to limit on those types of things. Uh, as always, read the label before you buy the product and make sure it's what you're wanting to use. We don't want to go get generic Roundup and spray it on our whole field and then find out that we should have used a specific type of Roundup because we just killed everything rather than just the broadleaf weeds that we were trying to kill. So know what you're using and I'd be, I'd be glad to answer those questions if you guys have ever, uh, if ever had any questions out there. Uh, don't assume a pesticide purchased for one type of treatment can be used for another type of treatment. It's like medicines. It just it doesn't always fix multiple things. And then my favorite one, buy only what you need. How many of you guys maybe have some stuff sitting in a shop? Yeah. <laughs> we don't have to go, we don't have to incriminate anybody, but uh, I can tell you in Ponca City, we're one of the larger cities. We only do pesticide disposals every two years. So if you buy more than you need, you're gonna have it sitting on your shelf for a long time. Sometimes you don't even need more than about 16 ounces of it or something for the whole application. So don't buy too much, don't spray too much as well. All right, know the weather. And this here goes back again to read the label. Uh, these are general rules. In many cases, if the wind's over 10 miles per hour, you're gonna have a little bit of drift. That may be drift onto the neighbor's pasture with, uh, with broadleaf weeds, and they're okay that you killed their broadleaf weeds in their pasture. That may be a temperature over 95 degrees, which is usually the threshold for evaporation. So if you had gone out there and sprayed it mid-morning and it evaporates and then the wind picks up, takes it down, takes it to an area you didn't want it to go to. And then also if temperatures are too low, and this one here is key for a lot of our pollinators, Pesticide may reside for a longer period of time than you want it to, giving it more of a chance for pollinators or bees to come into contact with it. So they have something called a holdout period on a lot of herbicides, pesticides. Be sure to read up what that time period is and try to adjust in order to limit the harm for those pollinators. Toxicity of chemicals, and this year got a little bit, that doesn't look like it did when I made the slide. <laughs> But in general, fungicides, herbicides, and miticides pose very little risk to bees. Uh, I think neem oil falls under that uh, miticides as well. If they ingest it, it could be possibly a problem. But in most cases, they're not going to ingest it unless you've got it on the flower or something like that. Uh, the insect that we talked about, BT, except it exhibits very low toxicity to caterpillars, or very high toxicity to caterpillars, very low toxicity to a lot of your other beneficial pests. Common insecticides that are high risk, these are going to be the active ingredient. All pesticides are required to have a label that show the active ingredient on that. You're gonna see diazinon, amidion, malathion, malathion, and has anybody ever heard of this one? It's a very common one. And if you use the powder and it doesn't rain for a while, it's there for a while. Yeah. So be very careful. Not that it not that it doesn't serve its purpose. I'm I'm not completely against it, because like we said, if we have an infestation or an economic problem, so to speak, where it's gonna cost us a whole lot of money unless we get rid of that pest, it does a good job. But it's very dangerous to almost any insect out there. And then this year also is and I've got a slide on the end there, but this is where I got a lot of this information from is uh, from three particular fact sheets from universities and research. All right, we know this, bees like flowers. Man, did you, y'all you, didn't know I'd teach you that today. Did you? No, okay. But do your very best to not spray when the plant is flowering. Worst time you can do it. Your, the, the, the bees are busy that time, or maybe you've got a certain area uh, that you've cultivated clover or alfalfa or something like that, that is a bad time to spray. You are going to have a real good chance that you are possibly spraying right on top of or exposing them to that pesticide. So number one thing we can do, do not spray while it's flowering. 
Again, there are very few instances where we might have a infestation that's going to get worse if we don't do something about it, or it's going to possibly uh, become an economic problem. Maybe we have an invasive weed <laughs> that we need to take care of, but very few reasons to spray why there's lots of stuff flowering. All right, spray preventative ways we can ways we can prevent spraying during flowering. Preventative applications during the early spring, February and early March. We can spray our fungicides on our fruit trees right when they start to bud. There's not many flowers that those bees are going to go after at that time. And then also pre-emergent herbicides that we can spray before a lot of those weeds come out of the ground. That's going to be during again those. February, early March, where those temperatures aren't getting up to those levels where the bees and the pollinators are really moving around. Again, it's limiting it. There are certainly still pollinators out at that time period, but we're not going to hurt near as many of them if we do that. Along with, we're not going to run into as much of a problem later on. Do not spray any pesticides unless you are at an economic or infestation threshold. Big point right there. Time of day. Anybody ever gone and watched their bees at, in the evening? Not really, because they're kind of, they're going to bed. <laughs> so this was actually a, I had to dig out, I looked up on Google Scholar. If you guys are ever doing, you know, your own research and stuff and want to double check with it, Google, Google Scholar is wonderful. Someone, and then I, I should put pictures on here because it's pretty hilarious. Back about 10 or 15 years ago, they put these little chips and antennas on large carpenter bees because they were the only ones that were big enough to carry them. Nowadays, the technology's gotten a lot, of sm lot smaller, and these honeybees, they put RFID chips, just little chips, and when they came in and out of the hive, they checked in with when they did that, and they also had a couple of feeding stations to see when they were most active. Right here, that's about 9.30. When they just start going, 11 o'clock, Really, it spikes up, and this is like noon, two o'clock in that area. 1955, that's going to be, oh, probably about 8 p.m. right there, I believe, is when they go, when they go down. So, do what? Not like your piece. Do you have a light on them? No, I can see them. You can see them a little bit? And they start out, you can see the bees leaving the hive at 7 o'clock in the morning. Is that recently? Yeah, every Temperature. That's what I'm going to say, is the temperature's gotten up, so right now would not be a great time to spray that stuff. They like their warmth. <laughs> they like the warmth, certainly. Yeah. Bees like to work from 11 a.m. to sunset. Spray pesticides in the evening when bees are least active to lessen exposure. Okay. Again, read that label and find something that maybe only has a short four-hour period, and it's going to be, it's going to have done its job and be gone by morning time. Those bees will become active, and they will have very little contact. All right, in review, there are many instances where we don't need to spray. And we can do a lot of preventative stuff, like mechanical control, or maybe we haven't even reached the threshold. Maybe we're the guy sitting on the back of our porch and a little caterpillar fell from the tree, and we didn't really have to do anything about it, okay? If we do need to spray, read the label, know what you're spraying. Know the weather, the wind, and the temperature. If you've got a wind going to the north and your neighbor's beehive is right there going to the north, please don't spray because <laughs> that can cause some problems. Avoid spraying any pesticides during the flowering stage. Again, bees go after flowers, we know that. Know the toxicity of the pesticide to bees and other pollinators, and I've got a link on that sourcage page, sources page of a nice table that goes over the toxicity, the time period it needs to dissipate, the active ingredient, etc. Applying the, the evening to limit exposure to bees and other pollinators. If you have to spray, again, if you have to spray, that's the whole caveat to this, and you did all that, it's going to be a real, real low chance of hurting those bees and those pollinators out there. I just had a lady call me a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. I get all the phone calls for the, the send the bees. Uh -huh. and yep. stuff. She lives out in the Osage, and there's big ranchers or farmers, mm -hmm. and they sprayed their field, and it blew over and killed her garden and her grass. Yep, yep. Uh, and she looks upset. Yeah, I, I agree. I get a lot of phone calls of people who treated their yard with uh, 240, which is a very common broadleaf herbicide, 
uh, LB6, same kind of formulation, and they'll have their tomatoes and okra plants looking like they're going in circles and growing like crazy. And that's what they've done. They've sprayed their yard to kill the weeds in the yard, and it was effective on their tomato plants and their okra. So when people don't pay attention to that type of stuff, we get that wonderful unintended consequence, and in some cases, court cases. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and I, get, I try not to get too much in the middle of those types of things, but it does happen. Uh, and we usually, once or twice, there's been a tree that's been killed because someone sprayed so much. Um, Usually they weren't following those rules on that last slide and know the weather, wind, and temperature. You can see that when you drive around where the spray is. Somebody has sprayed something and you can see where it's went down trees. And yes, yes, yep. yep. I, I, I've quote unquote taken pictures of that. I, I, don't, I don't like to say investigate because I'm not an expert expert on diagnosing drift and that type of stuff, but uh, I've taken a lot of pictures to have the people at Oklahoma State who are experts uh, look at that. It happens more often than not, but I will say for a lot of your larger trees, if they do get a little bit of burn, so to speak, or drift, they're usually going to be able to be resilient and get through that. I, I get a lot of people who are wanting to know what happened to the, their elm tree. It's a 50-year-old tree and drive by it the next year and it's looking great. So a lot of the larger trees can make it through that. Uh, smaller little weeds, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where were we at? Uh, Michigan State University did a nice little how to control invasive pests while protecting pollinators. I grabbed a little bit of information from that. This EPA one is the one that has the table of how long the quote unquote holdout or dissipation time period would be for bees and then also the relative toxi toxicity to bees on there. So. There's a nice table on there, and there's some of them that are very low risk, according to research done by EPA and a lot of universities. And then that Massachusetts one, I think, is the one that I've got the sheet for that I had to hand around, I think. And that one has just a lot of good bullet points on what to do. All right. I always do this at the end of it, because <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> All right. We're going to do pollinator plants today, and I do have prizes for anyone who answers correctly. All right. <laughs> Do what? <laughs> we don't have money at the extension office, Dan. You know that. Yeah. Where did I put my other stuff? Yeah, we've got some, we've got some pretty nifty things here. I got some rain gauges. They're probably a little late. You won't get to use them for about two or three weeks here if you've seen the weather forecast. But we got them. Um, <laughs> maybe use it to water your yard and check on that. All right. This pollinator plant blooms from April to June. These are also all that I, I have seen these in Kay County. So this will help narrow it down a bit. It can have colors that range from cream, blue, and yellow. It is also in the pea family. Does anybody know? I've got some hints. Anybody want to get a chance to guess? I'll say cow peas. Cow peas, okay, good guess. That is incorrect, but <laughs> good guess. <laughs> Darn. Darn. All right, here's a pick. This is actually on my property. Milkweed, what is it? Milkweed. It is not a milkweed. But Leland, it's actually on my property. <laughs> With it. Not to oust Leland, but Leland's my neighbor. <laughs> so, it is not a soy. Here are the pods of it. Oh, I've seen those before. Yeah, yeah. All right, here's a final. Here's the final one. This is the blue version. It grows a little bit taller. The blue yellow blue. one grows even more taller. Blue indigo. There you go, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Wild indigo. I, never, yep. I didn't know came in anything with blue. I would always look, when I see it at the farms, a wild blue indigo. Yep. Yep. It's got kind of a partridge. What do they call that? Um, it's like an alfalfa type flower on it. But yeah. Would you like a rain gauge, Dan? Oh gosh. <laughs> Here you are, sir. I'll treasure this. Yes, please. I'll sign it for you, too. Tomorrow night, it's supposed to rain. Right. <laughs> he'll, he'll call me. I got, I got three tenths of an inch of rain. Hang up. Next day. I got no rain. Hang up. All right. Next one. This pollinator plant blooms from May to August, so it's actually out here right now. Um, and it does very well in clay soils. Uh, 
Livestock eat the younger plants, so you won't see it in grazing situations where there's livestock out there. It is in the aster family. Does anybody know what the aster family is? Sunflowers. Oh. Large, largely sunflowers. Sunflowers are in it, so it kind of gives you an idea. And it's named for its leaves that are said to face in the cardinal directions. We, we talked about it. I'm not going to let you win again. I'm not going to. Is it the black-eyed Susan? That's out right now. I, I thought about putting it on here. I did not put it on here. The, the cardinal direction is the giveaway on that one. Mm -hmm. I'll give you some pictures here. The sunflower. What tells you your cardinal? What, what tells you your directions? What, what tool do you use? A compass. Oh, is it comfort? Is that what it is? The compass point. I heard you oh, say. Okay. <laughs> this is the 2012 Extension Agent's Handbook. It's eight years old, and there might be some outdated information. I haven't found any of it in 2020 information yet. It's a wealth of information. <laughs> You're well on your way to becoming an Extension Educator. I got a rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> what is it, Charlie Brown? Or I got a Snickers. I got that. Dan, I got a rock. <laughs> All right, next one. An important late season pollinator plant. This plant blooms from August to November. Uh, I think they use that November time period from like all the way up in Michigan or something. I don't think it blooms that late in Oklahoma. It's the state flower of Nebraska. I've lived in Nebraska for three years and I don't even know what <laughs> And you might say that this yellow wildflower is worthy of an Olympic medal. Well, actually, I lived in Iowa. I heard it. Goldenrod. Goldenrod. Didn't even have to look at the pictures of it. But there he is right there. You got a rain cage coming your way. <laughs> you guys are past that back. I'll call you. I'll call you and see if I got more rain. Well, well that's part of it. I we're on a rain map. We're on a walk. Yeah, I need to keep the information and make a rain map of it. Uh, yeah. All right. This is the last and final one. If anybody else is wanting a rain gauge, I've got plenty of them. If you want to stop by the office, I'll give you one. <laughs> They are cool prizes, you know. Um, sometimes found on the roadside, this pollinator plant in the milkweed family is named after one of our pollinators. Think broader, don't think like it's the leafhopper butterfly plant, it's much broader. It blooms from May to August, and it's Shannon's favorite wildflower for color and university reasons. Is that the butterfly bush? I heard it. The butterfly bush? I'm going to take that, yeah. It's the butterfly weed. Butterfly yeah, weed. but uh, this one actually has cultivar varieties that you can buy. Uh, it does really well in Oklahoma, and I mean, it grows in ditches on the roadside, so it does pretty well. Uh, pretty low maintenance. I have heard that you can transplant them if you were to see one, like, on your roadside and try to bring it into the garden area. I have not heard of anybody having success with that. Uh, there's research that shows, but I've never heard of it. That thing you guys have on Saturday. Sun. With Casey. Oh, uh, Oklahoma Garden. Yeah, they said not to try that because it, they won't live. Yeah. That you have to go and you have to wait until the seeds and stuff and, and pick them. I've heard success with seeds. I had that uh, again, I have heard success in practice here with transplanting. The information that I got off of this from the Curve Center for Sustainable Agriculture out in Eastern Oklahoma says you can. So if anybody wants to try it, they can, but otherwise, the seeds work just as well. There's yeah. one down the road for me I always watch, but I never got brave enough to try to kill it. <laughs> <laughs> I would hesitate to do it because, I, 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 like I said, I haven't seen success with transplanting it, but no, it's, it's a, I, I'm going to definitely try to get this into my garden someday because I, I think it's cool. I'll some seeds for hairy balls. They were a lot of fun to grow. Have you ever seen them? Puff balls? Yeah, did they yeah. grow to be bushes? Now these are real long, real tall. They grow like six foot and they get these. They used to, years and years ago, it said they used to call them balloon plants, but now they call them hairy balls. And okay. it's these big balls that are full of seeds. And, and they were just covered with the caterpillars. And you have to take a picture of it for me. I'm, I, I've seen, but they, they have one called a puff ball plant and it grows like a shrub. It grows like 15 foot tall. Um, it may be the same thing. Maybe we might be talking about the same thing. Yeah. Well, we bought, we bought the seeds. We
we bought the plants, didn't we, in Stillwater at the, that, that place. We saw the plant farm? Yes. Yep. Yep. I'm going to go ahead and put this up here. Uh, there's my contact information. It's also on that last page of the slideshow. If you didn't get one, it's up by the little orange extension cord up here if you'd like another uh, thing in the slideshow. We have a lot of social media out there. I know a lot of people do that. We try to keep you updated and post as often as possible. Um, sometimes we go a week without posting something just because we got busy or something like that, but we try to post relevant information. Uh, K County OSU Extension, we started a YouTube channel. I think I've got like 20 followers now, big time. Yeah, yeah. We, we touch a wide array of, of topics, whether it's just timely updates, uh, things going on. Uh, I've also done a couple of videos on wildflowers that showed up in my classroom. Um, and then we've also done a little bit on fencing. I don't know if y'all have any barbed wire fencing. I'm, I like, I was a Boy Scout, so I like knots, and then I also like fencing, so I did videos on fencing knots. So, sword fight. <laughs> no. And then also, uh, basically every Friday morning at 7:40 on 100.7 KPNC and 99.3 KLOR, we do uh, about a five seven minute segment with the morning shows there. So if you guys are ever tuned in and you hear us, that's us. Sometimes we do 4-H stuff, sometimes we have Brenda come in, and then sometimes I talk about tomatoes or something. So, yep. Uh, that's all I've got today. If you guys have any questions or anything like that, feel free to call me, email me, any of that stuff. But thank you so much for having me. This is the first non-Zoom meeting that I have done since March. You did a good job. Thank you. <laughs>